Well, thank you all for being here, and we're so excited that you're here. Um, you know, we're going to have an interesting and great conversation today, and I, of course, want to thank everybody, all of y'all, for being and our panelists. But before that, I just want to say I want to call on uh, Dean Addington to say a few words. I'm Michelle Addington, I'm Dean of the School of Architecture here. Um, what's very interesting about tonight and of course the, the fact that it is part of a series of different types of discourses, events, conversations, and hopefully changes uh, that we're beginning to make at the School of Architecture, is that it really began with a conversation about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, and I think you all should uh, correct me exactly when that, that <coughs> took place, with a group of community and regional planning students who called a meeting with me and wanted to talk to me about issues of diversity of the school. And they brought with them a manifesto. A manifesto that talked about it from a variety of different ways, from curricular ways all the way through. And, and one of the things that, that really sort of caught me on this, they also wanted to know why the School of Architecture had not appropriately honored John Chase. Uh, and as many of you know, John Chase was one of the three first individuals, uh, African American individuals, to enroll at the University of Texas. Uh, the first to graduate, uh, the first to graduate from the School of Architecture, the first to graduate from the university, but also the first to graduate from the School of Architecture, uh, the first African American architect licensed to practice architecture uh, in Texas, and the accolades go on from there. And after that meeting with the community regional planning students, of which I know there's at least two in here today, if you could raise your hands, who, who was there at that, that uh, previous meeting, um, that uh, um, I began to, to pay attention, you know, more and more to different types of discussions that were happening across the university. And the first thing that happened, and I think this is when I met Virginia last year, was the, the Human Sweat Symposium to honor uh, the family of John Chase. Uh, later conversations with Donna uh, about this, and then uh, we heard that there was an exhibition at the Houston uh, Public Library that a number of us went out to see and realized that we wanted to bring it here. And what's really exciting uh, about tonight is recognizing that not only are we seeing uh, the fruits of what a, a small group of students started at the university, hopefully what we're seeing is actually the seeds of the engagement that we want to be having here, that we need to be having here. Uh, what we've been doing in the last year where we've been looking at our past, and particularly in looking at our past in relationship to seeing all of the history that simply had been whether it was erased, whether it was neglected, whether it wasn't recorded, that was a major part of what we just started to crack a little bit into last year. Um, but tonight is also about where do we move forward? How do we go forward? How do we sort of build on that uh, so that it's a seed that really is planted to start to sort of open up the conversation, more voices, more inclusive, uh, uh, an architecture, a planning, a design, a community uh, that embraces every voice that's out there because we know that's a richer community. Uh, we know that's a more innovative community. Uh, and that is the community that we want to be involved in having a part on. So tonight is about sort of turning and looking forward, uh, looking to what we're going to be doing next. And I said, I, I could not be uh, more humbled. Uh, by the fact that this was entirely planned by our students. And I hope that would, would all the students who are involved in planning please stand up on this. <laughs> this is something that, um, uh, and, and maybe I should feel chastened by this as well, uh, that uh, we've had two amazing events uh, over this semester, um, and some of the best attended events we've had, both planned by students. So I think we're learning a little bit about uh, what kinds of conversations, uh, what types of symposia, what types of engagement that we need to be having here uh, at the School of Architecture. 
uh, I'm looking forward to tonight. I think you all have brought together a slate of individuals that is provocative, uh, and I think no holds will be barred in terms of, of what will be on the table uh, for our discussions. Uh, again, I don't think as faculty we could have done as good of a job of bringing together who are some of the most significant figures uh, dealing with how we address our community moving forward. Uh, and I would welcome all of you here. We're going to have a, a, a reception at the end for those of you who haven't seen the exhibit for John Chase. Uh, it's in its last few days. Uh, so uh, we, we are looking right now at actually securing some of the items from that exhibit to be able to keep on permanent display at the school. That was also in their manifesto uh, that mm -hmm. they delivered to me last year. Uh, the opportunity to have some permanent display uh, of John Chase, and, and it looks like we're going to be able to do that. And uh, but please, we're going to have that wonderful reception after by the exhibit for those of you who haven't been there. But without further ado, I want to introduce Nicholas Armstrong to you, who's going to be introducing the panel. So good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to reiterate our thanks. Um, to all of you for coming out. Um, we're certainly glad to have you here. Um, as well as to our panelists for taking the time to participate in the event. Um, just please allow me to briefly introduce them. Um, tonight we're grateful to have uh, Ms. Donna, Donna Carter. She's the president of Carter Design Associates. As well as Ms. Virginia Cumberbatch, who's also the director of community engagement and social equity um, at the University of Texas for the Division of Community Diversity and Community Engagement, excuse me. Um, we're thankful to have Ms. Nefertiti Jackman, who's the Executive Director of Six Square, Austin's Black Cultural District. Um, council Member Natasha Harper-Madison, she's a Council Member for the, for the City of Austin, District 1. As well as Dr. Kazike Prince, who is the Senior Policy Advisor and Education Coordinator for the Office of Austin City Mayor, um, Steve Adler. And so again, we'd like to thank you all for coming out. I also want to thank um, the School of Architecture, uh, most notably, Dean Addington, as well as Dr. Charlton Lewis um, for working with us as students and playing this event. Um, and of course, the event wouldn't be what it was without um, the assistance from the team that I've worked with um, from the uh, Community and Regional Planning Student Organization, um, most notably our diversity chairs, uh, Ms. Sagnika Das and Ana Vindek, who are at the back, as well as Awe Cesar. And so with all that being said, um, before we move forward with the actual panel discussion, um, it would be impossible for us to truly honor the legacy of Mr. Chase without understanding just who he was. Um, as Dean Addington uh, mentioned before, he was a man who achieved a number of firsts in his life. Um, through his persistence and courage, um, as well as the forces of history, he was one of the first African-American students to attend graduate school here at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, he graduated from the School of Architecture in 1952 um, and subsequently became the first licensed black architect in the state um, that was a position that he held by himself for um, up to 10 years. It wasn't until the mid to late 1960s um, when another African American became registered in the state. Um, but, you know, as Mr. Chase moved forward towards forging his career, he encountered many restrictions. In the early to mid 1950s, he found that no architecture firm would hire him um, despite having an advanced degree. Nevertheless, he embodied what it meant to actually break barriers not only paving a once restricted path for African Americans, but also establishing his own practice and later using his position to support African American architects, engineers, and draftsmen throughout the country. Um, what's important to note is that as he went forward in his career, he also used his position to help other minority professionals in that field. Um, as the first black president of the Texas Exes, which is the alumni association or organization here at the University of Texas, um, he went on to become the founder of the National Organization for Minority Architects, as well as the first black man to serve on the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts. Um, so clearly he's a man who blazed many trails for those who would follow him. Speaking more to his architectural expertise, his career demonstrates an affinity for democracy and unity, which is a testament to the innovation that he sought to bring to the field of architecture at a time when this really was not the norm. Um, by and large, he was known for building not only physical structures, but also communities. His architectural philosophy embraced the Usonian ideals of Frank Lloyd Wright, and he aimed to create spaces that brought people together and built communities. Um, having started his career working specifically on black churches in Houston, 
Chase designed buildings that encourage social and recreational activity. Uh, being creative and modern, he often provided for bright, spacious public spaces, um, as well as a minimalist approach that incorporated clean design and emphasis on the human element of architecture. Local examples of his work in Austin include the David Chapel Missionary Baptist Church, um, which the remodeled structure was completed in 1959, and Mr. Chase served as principal on that project, and that stands today in the heart of East Austin. Um, that church actually exemplifies the concepts that he presented in his master's thesis, which was entitled Progressive Architecture for the Negro Baptist Church, um, in which he sought to employ spatial manipulations and openness that he studied in depth while a student here at UT. Um, the Phillips House, which is also located in East Austin, um, was completed in 1966 for the wife of Mr. Oscar L. Thompson, who was the first African American to earn a degree from the University of Texas. Um, the house, with its innovative and eclectic design, stands apart from other more traditional ranch style homes in the neighborhood. And once again, we see through that building that Mr. Chase was an innovator. As the 1960s came to a close, moving into the 1970s, Mr. Chase began receiving larger commissions that extended beyond just building churches and homes. Um, he contributed a great deal to the development of the Texas Southern University campus in Houston, um, designing the Martin Luther King Jr. Humanities Building in 1969, as well as the Ernest S. Sterling Student Life Center and the Thurgood Marshall School of Law Buildings in 1976, both of which, might I add, still stand today. Um, Chase also collaborated with various other large projects, including the development of the George R. Brown Convention Center in Houston, which also stands today, um, the famous Houston Astrodome, as well as a commission to design the United States Embassy Building in Tunisia. While Mr. Chase departed this life in 2012, it's clear that the legacy that he leaves behind is one that is cherished by all who encounter it, um, but most especially by those of us here today at the University of Texas at Austin, and of course, certainly the communities in which he worked. Um, in February 2018, the, Uni the University of Texas purchased the original headquarters for the Colored Teachers State Association of Texas, which was one of his first projects in the 1950s. The building, which is located at 1911 Navasota Street in Austin, will become the home of the UT Community Engagement Center, which is part of the university's Division of Diversity and Community Engagement, also known as DECE. Through his many accomplishments, John Saunders Chase truly embodies resilience, determination, and innovation, all of which are ideals that are not only integral to the East Austin experience, but also to the human experience. Um, his work throughout the state of Texas, but most especially in East Austin, stands as a living testament to the pivotal role that his architectural expertise played in providing communities with much needed resources for self-sustenance, as well as motiv motivation and mobilization toward ongoing political activism. Um, I think I can speak on behalf of all of those of us who uh, planned the event in saying that we really hope that this panel will encourage students to utilize the knowledge that they gain in their classrooms to become catalysts for positive change in their communities. Likewise, we hope that the greater Austin community at large will see the importance of understanding the past and its many lessons as we work toward building a more inclusive present. And so with that being said, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Awais Azar, who is our moderator, and we'll get started with our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, and, and I think the one thing I want to mention is, you know, we left out introductions this conversation because there was so much to talk about. So what we're going to say is if you really want to learn more about folks, we have that in the brochures for sure, and I just want to thank you all for being here. So I'm just going to jump right into it, and I'll start with you, Ms. Cumberbatch. Um, I know, and she's laughing because we went to school together, and I'm like, Virginia. But I think to say, um, you know, what does it mean, first of all, I think, for John Chase's legacy in terms of the university actually purchasing a building that he designed for your office to move in there? And then I think beyond that, you know, you wrote as we saw it. Like, there was a book that Virginia had been working on co-authoring, and a lot of work that VC had done in terms of honoring some of our first African-American students in the university. So I really want to hear, you know, honoring his legacy, what does it mean for the school to also be purchasing? Well, first of all, thank you guys, all the students who 
wrote the amazing manifesto uh, <laughs> and have been um, committed to seeing that um, those mandates through. And so it's really exciting to be in a space to be here tonight that not only honors John, uh, John Chase, but hopefully also pushes the agenda forward around how the School of Architecture can really be um, a, a community steward and help to elevate important discourse. Um, so I think when I think about um, the book as we saw it and sort of how we saw that as a tool, um, and then the way that UT has just functioned sort of um, throughout its existence, right, is that UT serves as sort of a microcosm of these larger conversations and patterns of, um, of equity in the city, right? And so when we think about um, sort of the beginning years of integration at the university, they were mirroring a lot of the political discourse, a lot of the political structures happening not only on a local level in Austin, but throughout the US. And so um, when we think about the power of story and the power of visibility, right, I think John Chase's legacy and the idea that students were so committed to seeing his story sort of unearthed and elevated is really important. Um, and so the idea that if we don't document conversations, if we don't document narratives, right, then they only go unseen, right, but they become in some ways erased, um, and therefore they can't be used as sort of um, an opportunity for political leverage about how we build equity as a community. And so I think when we connect um, the story of the precursors, and the precursors of what the title we give the first generation of black students at the University of Texas, so pretty much between 1950 to the mid-70s is what we consider precursors. Um, the reason why this book was so critical was that, you know, as students were navigating this campus, right, um, there were everyday reminders that this space was literally not built for them, right? When we think about the names that adorn uh, the hallways, right, when we think about the statues that used to be on the mall, right, and the idea of that we document and we recognize what we value. Right? And if you don't see yourself in that documentation, whether it's the erection of a building or it's a documentation through a book, right? what does that say to you psychologically, what does that say to you socially, politically, that um, how you're valued in that space and the ways in which you should navigate that space. And I think that's so you know, on par with the way that architecture works, right? And I think that's why John Chase's legacy is so critical is because um, his sort of approach to his work was really taking into consideration sort of this cultural ethos of how do I honor, recognize, and celebrate the black community, the black diaspora through my work? How do I make sure that 50, 60, 75 years from now, um, there's an understanding that they were here and they contributed to building the social landscape and legacy of the city? And so it's been such a dream. Um, co-author is here, Leslie Blair. When we started writing this book back in 2014, it was um, around the same time as sort of Ferguson, um, and a lot of the riots happened, or I'm sorry, the protests happening around the conversation of um, black bodies and policing. And so that was really having an effect on sort of the community psyche on this campus, um, along with sort of helping to debunk this idea that as a city we're progressive and liberal, and yet we're highly segregated and highly inequitable. And so to be able to come back to a space like the space on 1191 Navasota, which will become our new home as the Center for Community Engagement, I think is this beautiful sense of symmetry, a man that broke the barriers here at UT, built this building around the principles of education, specifically for black people. It was the Negro Teachers Association. And then for now to be connected again to this idea of community engagement and education is really awesome. But making sure that we do that with um, an understanding and approach that it's still about the community that lived there and the community that's been upholding that space for decades. And that we aren't just coming into that community, but we're co-laboring alongside of them to bring about equity in our city. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hart, I'm gonna have a question for you if you like you're the one who's going to be tangibly working on preserving that space. You're like <laughs> engaging with uh, you know, Chase's legacy in the most tangible, physical way. So I would, I think, love to hear about that experience and what does it mean? Well, it, it, at times I'm incredibly angry about it. So I'm the oldest one up here and you could probably add everyone's age and sort of get to me. 29? Yeah. <laughs> so, so it starts with this, with this anger that it's taken until now to even see a value um, in the building. I mean, it is the um, 
It is that anger about what we thought and talked as preservation, as what is important. It is also um, an anger that, that somehow John Chase is important because he was the first African American to graduate from the, the architecture school. And if I think that the year of my birth, he was the first one, and suddenly that's part of my, it's not part of my history, it's part of my everyday life. So suddenly, so there's an anger there, there's an anger as I move forward that even as late as the 70s, there were still firsts, and then when I actually look at my own license, um, I'm told I'm the first African American woman to be registered in Texas. And that is a deplorable situation because it robs me, and to a certain degree it robbed John Chase, of the ability just to do what he loved to do. And so there is also a joy because I'm hoping that you as new architects, as new planners, as new um, people that, that, that are defining what it means to be these professions and defining what it means to be in much broader terms, that you, no matter whether you're a woman, African American, uh, Native American, whomever you are, can actually first start and do what it is that you love to do. But yes, then I'm happy. I mean, I'm incredibly happy that I'm, that first of all, that the University of Texas, because my, my experience with the University of Texas, I did not go here. I am not a Native Texanite. I am everything that Texans say they don't want to happen sort of, <laughs> uh, with, with, within their country. Uh, so uh, my experience, if we go back 35 years, was UT was just gobbling up East Austin. And it gobbled and gobbled and gobbled to the point where um, they were feeling progressive when they came to a truce, that we won't go beyond this line because we have what we need here. Um, and so now to flip that and actually go and work with the, with the, the um, uh, you know, permanent construction office about how do we preserve this and how do we do it in a way that speaks to what it was and what that meant at that time. <coughs> It's a modest building. It's no larger than a small house. Yet at the time it was built, it was built of substantial materials, it was built of commercial materials, and it was built to allow people from all over the state, teachers all over the state, to come and talk not only about how do we educate our children, because it's not being done outside of us, but how do we also elevate and provide educational opportunities for our educators so that they can continue to be these educators. So to be able to, to bring that space back to life and also talk about what does it mean to have a commercial space surrounded by community, surrounded by residential, it allows you to have the conversations that we're going to have as professionals every single day as planners, as architects, about what does it mean to build and be in this community. It, there's, there is joy now that we're finding value in that, and that we can actually look back and people want to look at his drawings and look at how he did work, how, how were things working, that we can think of him as an architect and as an artist, not as a first. And so that's where, that's where I, can, I can find my pleasure. But I quickly go back to being the angry old lady, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with that too. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. And I think as you were talking about um, you know, the community that that lives in, I think one of our you know, things that I wanted to ask Council Member Upper Madison was, you know, Chase was designing an East Austin that was very different from the East Austin that we know today, and I think celebrate as a city in some ways. 
and I wanted to hear from you, like, what does it mean to be representing that district and that community? Wow, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. that's a mouthful, right? Because uh, I think, uh, I'm Natasha Harper-Madison, council person for District 1, which is the historic Eastern Crescent. Um, we go down almost as far south as uh, 7th Street, out towards the ETJ territory, near the Expo Center, around Decker, Loyola area. We go north, upwards towards Manor, and then most of the central East Austin area. Um, and so, first of all, District 1 is huge, right? It's 46 square miles. Um, and that to say there are multiple parts of East Austin, but I think traditionally, in fact, when I talk to people about East Austin, I think they're thinking one space. They're thinking that six square miles, you know, that area between 7th and MLK, I-35 and airport. That's East Austin, you know. So it's, a, it's pretty multi-tiered in that there are lots of communities within that that we're representing. You know, there are black and brown cowboys, you know, in East Austin historically and currently uh, that a lot of folks don't know about. Um, so it means legacy, it means ultimate and deep responsibility, um, which in a lot of ways feels daunting, frankly. Um, it feels prideful, um, it feels like the weight is on my shoulders to figure out how to leverage our assets as a community to both passionately preserve our past, um, but really approach with a robust fashion pragmatism for our future. What does it look like for the future of East Austin? So we often talk about the declination of the black community in Austin. Um, but I was at a meeting the other day and the lady who chaired the meeting, she and her partner are both African-American women. They just moved here from DC. And there were 27 black people in this room who all just moved to East Austin. So she was talking about the return of black folks to East Austin and what that meant to them, you know, and that conversation was deep. And so I think that's another thing that I feel about representing the district is making certain that we don't Two things, making certain that we don't make blackness synonymous with poverty and struggle, because far too often people do that, and it's unfair and it's inaccurate. Um, also, making certain that all of the voices that represent the black community of East Austin are equally relevant. Um, I sometimes hear, you know, folks sort of outstruggle one another, you know? <laughs> my, my struggle was deeper than yours. You, you can't possibly understand my struggle. And that's unfortunate, because it takes all kinds, right? It takes all of us, you know, to really make up that beautiful tapestry that is the black experience in Austin. Um, there's, a, there's very little in the way of historically relevant cultural assets, you know, in, in terms of buildings, because I frequently think that the culture isn't the buildings, it's the people. It's the community. But the buildings are entirely relevant. And you know, I wrote a few things down. The historic landmark criteria for the city of Austin, the building has to be at least 50 years old, has to be high in integrity, have architectural significance, um, have some historical association, archaeological significance. Um, there has to be a community value that contributes to cultural and or neighborhood character neighborhood character, that's a tricky one, um, uh, and have a distinct landscape. That to say, in a community like Austin, that whose history is frankly segregationist and racist, and you know, uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of work to do, and it's difficult to find yourself in a position where you rise to prominence to meet this criteria when you live in a city that intentionally, by design, makes it very difficult for you to do so. I mean, Mr. Chase, for example, moved to Houston because he couldn't get hired in the city of Austin. No firms would hire him. Mr. Chase is a real good example of the black experience in Austin. It doesn't matter if you acquire education. It doesn't matter if you have skill and talent. There are still so many barriers to success in this great city um, that we do have a declining black population. Um, so 
I think I mostly answered your question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All that to say, I, it is a, it is my deepest, greatest honor to be able to represent the area of town where I was born and raised, where I did have a challenging formative experience. We were highly transient and sometimes homeless. And so there are a lot of folks in District 1 whose lived experience I know from experience. And it is 100% my honor to be able to be their voice at the municipal government level. Um, Ms. Jackman, I think one of the things I heard in the Gossamo's remarks is this, you know, wanting to celebrate <coughs> black Gossamo's and black culture. And I think your work with Six Square and working to essentially preserve and celebrate that black culture and the folks in, in Austin, I think part of that is, of course, John Chase and his legacy within that district. Mm-hmm. I would love to hear more from you about that. Sure. Um, thank you for having me, uh, having us in this discussion tonight. Um, I would first like to give you a scenario that I think it would help to put the importance of preserving the culture or black culture or culture in general in perspective. Uh, So we've all seen what has happened with the cathedral in Notre Dame, right? Um, And less than, they were about to lose over 800 years of cultural knowledge and history, Uh, but there was a rush to save and preserve as much of the cultural artifacts as they could. Firefighters ran in there and preserved the, they found the crown of thorns that um, some say Jesus wore and other important art pieces. And when I think about the rapid response of the firefighters and then the rapid response of the philanthropists In less than 24 hours, over $300 million was raised. We know it's up to over a billion now, right? And now philanthropists are having a lot of criticism for that rapid response, and that's going to be tricky as well. But it was a quick burn, and people understood the urgency of protecting all of that cultural knowledge and the importance that that cathedral meant to that community. And what we are seeing, what's happening in East Austin, and I specifically, um, our district represents uh, the smaller section that Natasha referred to, the six square mile radius where black people were forced to live in um, Austin. It's a slow burn, a very slow burn. So the response has been very slow and lethargic and we've lost many important historical assets and cultural assets. There are still many that are there, Uh, and so that's why it is important that we continue, how do we shift our focus and preserve what is left so that we can tell the story, the narrative of the African American community, of their resilience, uh, both of the built environment which includes structures that um, John Chase built and other structures as Rosewood Courts and Downs Field and the many other churches that are located throughout um, the area. But then it's also the stories and the narratives and how you preserve all of those so that there can be some representation of um, the contributions of the black community so that we can ensure that the narrative of Austin is fully fleshed out and fully understood because if we only have one perspective, our understanding of Austin's past is very warped. So um, I think I I feel Donna and I often think about uh, my work. It is daunting, like Natasha said, because I, I feel the urgency, but I can't go quick enough. We can't go quick enough because we're competing with both time, and no one can beat time, right? Uh, There's the developers and the rapid change that is, I mean, you can go out and one day, I will say this, this happened one day with a new building that's um, sort of in between Rosewood or Rosewood Street uh, and next to the Hillside Pharmacy. 
And I like change. I like new structures. And there's this beautiful new structure, and they were celebrating the grand opening. And as I left my office, which is right on San Bernard Street, um, I didn't even know this would happen, but a tear just rolled down my eye, uh, rolled down my eyes. Um, they're celebrating, but I'm lamenting the change in this community. And um, so it is, it is painful. And I wish the work could have been done 20, 25, really 30 years ago. Really, I think it's like 30. If not more. Oh, 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 okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Because there weren't really yeah. Yeah. every woman anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but with that said, what I will say is that I am always very optimistic. Um, and I do see the work, not only the work that we are doing to preserve the stories and the assets, um, but the importance that the city has seen in preserving that legacy by even investing in our organization. But then also, there are many other community partners, but I'll start first with the city. So um, the Historic uh, Commission, the City's Historic Commission, Steve Sadowski gets it, but I'm working uh, particularly with uh, Kara Bertrand. There are efforts to designate certain communities as um, historic neighborhoods so that they can benefit from some of the uh, laws to protect certain neighborhoods. Right now, uh, we're looking at College Heights, and so we're going to, an uh, application will be submitted so that could become a historic neighborhood. And one of the criteria or the feedback that I said is can we make sure, where can we protect the most number of homes and people of African American descent? We have looked at San Bernard, which is where we are, but there, it's changed, it's gone. And I said that's, to me that was pointless. So let's look at a neighbor, another neighborhood. So there are efforts by the city, uh, as well as the Parks Department. Um, the Parks Department, there are several efforts at Gibbons Park, Pease Park, um, Rosewood Park to do some interpretive planning to tell the history and the story of the people who made that those communities very important, as well as Downsfield. I was just con contacted uh, about some additional work at Downsfield. So there is an effort there from the city department, right? But then there are also other organizations, academic institutions, like uh, the Division um, of Diversity and Community Engagement, some of the work that they are doing to preserve the stories. And I can talk of a number of community partners. I went to a this morning, and Council Member um, Harper Madison was there as well. There was an unveiling at Blackshear Elementary School, and that was created by that was a community-led effort, and there were so many people out there when we were telling the story. The, the mural is just one thing, but it allows us to tell the story of an important educator, an important figure, an important figure in that community's history, and that was Principal Friendly Rice. And so there are other community groups who see the urgency, and I, I like to say a spark has been lit, and I think it's, it's a little exciting, Again, I wish it had happened earlier, um, but it but it is you know it's something that I see happening, um, and there is an awareness and an importance that uh, an awareness that is going on, and people are even seeking out our tours and other things because they want to understand and learn the history, and I do see that as a positive, and like you shared, also planting the seeds. What do we do to plant the seeds for? the people in the future who are coming. I've been told to don't worry about the people who are gone. Because for many of them, what they see today is very painful in East Austin. It's a painful reminder of what happened in the past, of them being forced into East Austin and then being pushed out. But um, with the assets and by us providing culturally relevant programming, there is an excitement and a vibrancy that I do see happening that is still um, being cultivated in East Austin. And I know that new people are looking for ways to connect with community. And I think the work that we are doing 
helps to sort of build on that. And I think um, I see it as a, as a great opportunity to build and lay some foundations for the future of what East Austin might look like. Dr. Benz, you know, the question I had for you, I'm gonna slightly change it now. Of course. Because mm -hmm. I'm gonna take it on the moment as it's happening because the conversation I think is so rich. Um, and I think you know, the conversation I was gonna have was really about you know, John Chase and the fact that, you know, as you know, Ms. Carter said, we talked about him as the first student in this institution here, in this school, um, and how we support our students. But I'm also thinking, how do we support the community in East Austin, right? The folks who are coming and the folks who are still there, how do we support them? And I know you've been involved in this work for a while. So. A little while, a little while. Uh, first, let me start off by saying, I come to you as a African-American man, cisgender, uh, father of two adults now. My son's birthday is actually today. Today. Uh, 19 year olds young. Uh, so I will be leaving after we have our talk to go to his little shindig to see uh, the Avengers. <laughs> uh, get out and see it. Um, three, and half, three and a half hours, I think. Um, uh, I come to you. And he's 19 years. <laughs> my dear, too. Okay. I'm still working on that. Uh, and um, I also come to you as a person who's lived in East Austin for of the 16 years I've been here. I've lived 14 years in East Austin, actually down the street from the Carver, and now I live over in the closer to uh, Balm Street, further east. Um, and so I've been here long enough to know that Austin's probably one of the places I've been where I've met some of the friendliest racists I've ever come across. <laughs> um, and as a uh, president of Houston Tilt would say, uh, Austin is, is kind of like a, uh, a white Atlanta. Uh, people come here, and if you're white, you're just so excited to be here. Uh, it's wonderful. But I do see Austin as a, uh, a magical city in a lot of ways, as our mayor would say, because in my 15 years, it took me seven to get accustomed here. And in that time, yeah, seven, yeah. Okay. Uh, But I think about East Austin, and one of the things I've been working on in the mayor's office over the last four years is it started off as the spirit of East Austin and then translated it into the mayor's task force on institutional racism and systemic inequities. And that began, or continued, I should say, a conversation about the bedrock, the, the, the groundwater of racism that was going on in the city and still continues. We're a city that's often known as being friendly and progressive and hippie, and this is if you're, if you're in your 20s, this is where you come to retire. This is the one, number one single city in the country. Uh, this is the best place to live for the third year in a row. These are all the good things that you hear, but one of the things I will remind you is it depends on who you ask. Uh, if you're African American, you saw, if you've been here long enough, if you've heard from your friends, you talk about the exodus of black folks, not just out of the the, the area, but out of the entire city. You hear about how tough it is when you go downtown and you walk around, and I'm there pretty much every day, and I can sit in a corner and not see another person of color, let alone an African American, sitting downtown. Now, it's gotten a little bit better. I see a little here, a little there, but still, when as a person who's, I'm from the bloody fifth, fifth ward, Houston, Texas. I've lived in New York, I've lived in Atlanta. I know what a, a diverse city is supposed to feel like. And so I'm being here, it, it feels kind of weird, but there's some good things. But again, my point is, is that when you're looking at the vibrancy of East Austin, it's coming here with a different mindset. If you come in here thinking this is New York or Atlanta or one of those kind of cities, you're gonna be disappointed. You have to come here with a certain kind of entrepreneurial mindset where you're gonna go out and find folks as the former city manager used to say, when he wanted to find a barber, he went, where he, could he find a barber? He said, well, MLK. He went to MLK, he drove as far as he could until he found a barbershop. That's different than when I lived in Atlanta where it was just like a, a rock's throw. I could find a barber, I could find my clothes, I could find food, I just I knew where to go. Austin, you have to be more creative. But as far as what you do and what we've been doing in the city is, one, having this conversation unapologetically about racism. You know, calling it out when it's there. Uh, one of the biggest challenges, because we're such a nice and kind of uh, friendly kind of town, uh, if you bring up racism, somehow you get called a racist by some people. Somehow you're a troublemaker. Uh, and what I've relished in being the mayor's office is specializing in being a troublemaker. Uh, specializing in causing problems. Uh, I joke, jokingly say to the folks I know on the stage, is like, so are, are you staying out of trouble? Or are you staying in trouble? I stay in trouble. Uh, and I say that jokingly, but that's how you create change. That's how you disrupt the status quo. Willingness to do things differently than we have in the past. It's asking hard questions, 
It's being polite, but it's also being comfortable with the discomfort that comes with some of these conversations. It's sometimes sitting down instead of standing up. And what I mean by that is that sometimes as a person of privilege, and as a heterosexual man, I have certain privileges, sometimes I need to shut up and sit down and let someone get in front of me. Not just let them, just get out of the way altogether. And when we have too many people as they're saying, well, I should be able to be in the front. I should have this. And I have maintaining the privileges they always have and really asking a different kind of question of how do I be part of this community and what is my role? And sometimes my role is to just sit back and sit back and support and encourage. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I would say part of it's also being involved. One of the things, I love watching the news. I do politics stuff. But one of the things I learned really quickly, and now be mind you, I'm not a politician in the truest sense. I didn't grow up thinking I would be a, in politics. Uh, but if you want to change something in your city, the best place for you to get involved is in city government. The best place you can. Now, they're not exciting meetings to go to, but if you want to know what's going on with our land development code, which is a very exciting conversation that's going on right now, very exciting conversation. I don't see any wounds. I think we're up until midnight. We're just like, oh, I love it. Um, but that conversation is important because when we're talking about issues of, of, of how do you create community, uh, what people are willing to deal with or not deal with in the communities. These issues come back to the fundamental things I started off with is racism. <laughs> because oftentimes when people will hide behind, well, we just don't need that in our neighborhood. And I'll give you one example. Um, everybody knows about the soccer, the soccer field that's going up, up north. Now, several years ago, uh, one person that went up there asking for that piece of land was Alan Graham. Now, Alan Graham runs a homeless, it's for the homeless community, but it's kind of alternative housing facilities over in East Austin. He had to actually go outside the city of Austin to make this come to fruition. He actually went up north to ask, you know, to try to make that happen. But the people in that community are like, no, not in my backyard. The idea of having homeless people in their community seemed to be somehow a problem. Because who they're thinking of this isn't who they want in their community. Fast forward, Alan Graham goes to East Austin. Now they're going, hey, let's put a soccer field. What do they say as response? Because they don't want a soccer field. Oh, let's put affordable housing up there. And then what I knew and what I heard was a ruse. A ruse about, we don't want a soccer field, and then when you don't get the soccer field, now let's put affordable housing. Well, we don't want that kind of affordable housing. And so this, this issue of racism keeps on coming up. We don't call it that, but that's a fundamentally what we're talking about, and that's what we're dealing with. And so those kinds of challenges is one, is calling it out when you see it, and then asking for real, um, real strategies and, uh, and approaches to really combat it and deal with it. And, and manage it as best you can, because it's going to be there. The challenge, I think, for many of us is, how do we become part of the conversation? How do I get at the table to be uh, part of the change that you're looking for? How do you support the people who are doing the kind of work that, that is kind of combating these issues? Those are the kind of things I think folks can be doing on a regular basis to really combat these challenges. Um, and and it's, more, it's more complicated than I'm giving it to you, but it's, it's being actively involved that really causes the kind of change people are looking for. I'm going to open up a question for everyone, and this is like a tough question. It's almost like a focus group. Please give me the answer that I would look for. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about in the school and the honoring, you know, Chase's legacy. But how, I guess the question is, how do we honor that in a way as a living legacy? You know, how do we move beyond just preserving a building or naming a classroom? Like, what does it mean to go to that community in which he was so invested. We see the love that he left in that community and the work that he left in. How do we truly honor his legacy within this school and honestly within this city? Okay. Let's pull back a little bit because, I mean, you mentioned, gee, if we had just been able to do this 20, or 20 years ago, I would say if we could just do this 30 years ago. Uh, you talk about, um, you know, we have to call it when we see it. So I think that part of what honoring a legacy and really learning from the experiences of John Chase, because you're, you're learning from that experience, you're learning from that time, is first of all, what is, what is the community that you want, to, uh, how do you want that community to look? How do you want that community to feel? But things, unfortunately, for whatever reason, happen very slowly. And so my story about why it didn't happen 35 or 40 years ago, I'm just coming to Texas. 
And what I see in Texas is coming from the Northeast and very urban already, very urban, the, you know, Boston's and the New York uh, area. Um, I see a, a city that, you know, it's like an infant. It's not even a teenager yet in terms of urban development. But I also see ethnic communities, because um, my communities were always displaced. Our homes were always somewhere in the South. We had come up with this, this revolution to find a job and to get, you got, got turned into the manufacturing or the um, you know, meat packing, the manufacturing, the industrial um, communities up there. Um, but I saw here, again, the, the cowboys. People that had been on the land, whose family through whatever vagaries of tenant farming, and that was not easy and not good, but people had land. And people had land for 150 years. And they are 100 years at that point. And there was no talk about how to preserve that legacy of, of ownership. And the economics, the racism of how you keep that land together, how, and, 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 and it, it's racism, but it's also so deeply embedded in every other aspect of our society in terms of those that have privilege want to keep it and devise ways of keeping it out of the hands of, of others. And that permeates and ripples all the way through. But I saw opportunity. Can, can I get people excited about the fact that they do have land and have had it in black hands for 100 years? Can I go to East Austin and get people excited? It's not a, a, you know, a, a very fancy Clara Driscoll house, or we were there this morning, uh, Virginia and I. It's not Laguna Gloria. It's not a mansion. It's not one of the houses on Windsor. But it still, it was built by someone, and chances are it was built by someone in that family. Can you get people excited about preserving that? And I will tell you, in 1974, 1975, on into 80s, nobody could have been driven out of this town on a rail. No one wanted to talk about that. And our community didn't want to talk about that because we had been forced there. And when you've been forced and put into a place and constrained, the first thing you want to do is to get out. And we don't understand that force that, that, that happened with integration, that happened with how do I make the most of it in a sense of my investment? So how do you, how do you get out? So I think understanding the times that formed the architecture and the architect and the man of John Chase, those are very valuable lessons. What is making you who you are are also very valuable lessons. And the, the trick is how do we use that to inform what we're doing, to learn and to be able to change all at the same time. Because that's how we push this forward and how we can step back. And all we can say now is we've lost a lot. But I still think there's a lot there. And not to be used for political gain, but to be used because it is truly a fundamental piece of what East Austin is. Every single house I have walked by, if I actually knock on the door, or have been invited in because, oh, my porch is falling down, what can I do to save my porch? And start to talk, to, it's happened, I, can, I have 10 addresses in my Rolodex right now that are absolute sleepers. And when you walk in and ask how that property came to be and who's there and what the stories are, it is absolute, it, it, it would make an incredible tour. Mm -hmm. And we don't think about that. And say, I know uh, Councilman Harper Madison has to leave, and I want to make sure you get a few words in before you go as well. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, well, I guess to start to answer your question, the event that I have to go to, the Red Cross is hosting. It's a, it's an event that is teaching people in uh, underrepresented, marginalized communities about disaster preparation, community resilience. Um, 
and it's ironic um, <laughs> that we're talking about this, right? And so what can we do to help? I'd start by saying this. Um, I often have to tell people whose intentions are very, very good um, when they attempt to advocate for people who didn't ask them to do so, that it's presumptuous and there is an air of condescension that is frankly unforgivable. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. <laughs> Ask people if they need your help prior to offering it because far too often when you attempt to help others, it's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you can do to help that's more important, more sustainable, more powerful, more substantive is sort of like what you said about municipal government. Um, a lot of us underestimate the power of being in a position to create policy. Uh, there are six black people on the second floor and two of them work in my office. And then there's you and then there's a handful of others. And I'm talking like 140 people. There are a lot of people on the second floor. But there are very few people that look like Dr. Prince and I at City Hall. And that's problematic. So if you have the opportunity to start capacity building that's what we gotta start doing. We have to start pushing ourselves in the direction of civic engagement, education, and execution. We have to put ourselves at the table. Nobody's gonna extend the invitation to you. Um, we also have to count on one another. So sometimes when we talk about racism, I can't help it, I'm, I'm kind of subversive too. So I'll look around the room to see who big mad. And sometimes <laughs> you see them like, you know, rolling their eyes and I can hear the like, quiet internal dialogue, not me, I'm not racist, I got black friends, you know. Uh, and that, that part of you, it's natural, it's human, it's a human reaction, right? That part of you, the instinct to go, well, not me, I'm the otherness of it, you know. Quiet that part and think through what's making you feel that way. Because sometimes you realize there's something to it and it has nothing to do with anybody trying to impose any guilt on you. It has something to do with somebody sharing their lived experience with you, and you can benefit from that. And you can affect your spheres of influence by spreading the knowledge that you acquire by being open. Um, and then lastly, I'd say opportunity. You know, creating spaces where people have opportunity. One of the things I reflect upon is my Leadership Austin experience. There was a gentleman in the room um, it was a fantastic experience. Leadership Austin is great in that the alchemy is perfect. You know, 62 people you never met from all walks of life, various professions, ages, um, gender, etc. And, you know, they started out great to where we have this team building exercise. So by the time you start having these really difficult conversations, you trust one another. And the conversation about race, <laughs> this gentleman said, well, I'm second generation American, you know, and my family got here from India and we figured it out and we're all prosperous. And frankly, I feel like black people squander the opportunities presented to them. And my instinct was, what? <laughs> you know, but because we were just having a truthful conversation, because you could have been thinking that and not said it to me. We were having a truthful conversation and then we talked through what you know the other person felt and by the end of the conversation what he said was I'm gonna take your idea and the idea I presented to him was so he's a hiring manager for a very very reputable firm I said given that you recognize your implicit bias the next time you go to hire exclusively look at the qualifications of the person don't look at their name don't look at their race don't look at their gender you do that and you're doing what you can to get us past that space where we fall victim to our implicit bias. And, you know, I guess I'll end it there. I really appreciate being here this evening. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, fellow panelists. And we'll, and we'll end soon as well, but I think Virginia wanted to say something to make sure. Um, just sort of to segue and make those connections. The event I was at this morning with Donna, we spent the whole day together. <laughs> uh, was I was speaking to a room of, um, I think, architects who were basically, they were all service principals of their firms. Um, and the title of my talk was Confronting Our Complicitness. 
and this idea of how do we truly build equity in our city. And when I think about the role that I'm imagining a lot of us um, in the room have, right, whether we're studying architecture or community planning, right, whatever way, that in some ways, in order to do that job completely comprehensively, we have to serve as storytellers, we have to serve as cultural anthropologists, right? And in, in an effort to realize that our work is curating the spatial sort of design of our city as well as the social and political sort of space of our city. And I, when we think about historically how that's been done, right, it's been segmented to a few people in power designing how people will live not only designing how people live, but uh, assigning value to those people, right? Creating a policy, right, that's in our city's DNA that decides who's valued, who's not, who gets resources, who doesn't, and then creating infrastructure, physical infrastructure to represent that division. A highway that says east-west, that says resource under resource, that says access to food, no access to food, right? And so when you think about your role in dismantling that, that means truly understanding that not only the historical context of those spaces and, and what ways it's appropriate to preserve them, but also understanding how have you and how have you done the hard work, right? Dr. Prince, you know, you talked about this lovely narrative that we've bought into as a city, right? I, I always like joke when I went away to college and came back, I thought we were on every top ten list. It was like Greenest city, live music capital of the world, best toilet paper, best place to eat a taco under a tree. It was just like every random top 10 list, we were on it. And I always like to distinguish those two things. It's like we love to latch on as a city to the convenient truth. Everyone does. The things that say that we are living in a thriving, prosperous city, that's convenience, right? And it's a lot harder to grapple with the inconvenient truths, right? The inconvenient truths that debunk the fact that we're not an equitable city, that we're a highly economically segregated city, right? That we haven't done our due diligence to make sure that the cultural expression of everyone in this city has a space to exist and to thrive. And so thinking about your work, you know, how do you step outside your comfort zone to make sure you've truly done what's necessary to not only acknowledge, but to honor and then to help cultivate the existence of every community in this city, right? And that may mean that architecture, we all know, it, it can't happen in a silo, it can't happen in a vacuum. You have to be in those spaces, um, and you know, as a council member, um, as Harper said, that this idea that don't just come into a community, right, without um, them asking, and that's, I think, the hard work of that, you know, I see Liz Mueller here, and the idea of, like, how does good research happen, right? It's the idea that it's reciprocal. It's the idea that it's mutually beneficial. It's the idea that you are coming alongside the community to figure out how you can be an asset. Not to use it as a laboratory, not to use it as a design think tank, right? But how are you actually serving the purpose to build a city that 20, 30, 45 years from now can say that everyone who steps into this space has the opportunity to thrive, has the opportunity to call this city the best place to live. Right, and what is your opportunity as architects, as community regional you know, enthusiasts? What is the work that's to be done to make sure that you are thinking critically, you're thinking thoughtfully, and you're thinking with this lens of equity um, around how we design and how we build community? Um, I can, can I, can I, I add something? Oh, yeah, just, <laughs> just briefly. Um, how many of you are architect students? or actually in the school, the program. Okay. What I will say, um, I was an interior design student, and it looked nothing like this. This is very diverse compared to my experience more than, more than 25 years ago, I get to think of it. But, uh, keep calibrating. But, I want to give you something, and I want you to go to a think tank. I was, uh, I was in graduate school, not for interior design, with a student who was working on, we used to eat lunch together, he was working on, he was an econ student, he was working on coming up with the next theory. I was like, what are you talking about? You know, like um, Newton's law of relativity, like I want to be the guy who comes up with the next theorem. It's like, wow, like that was profound. So those of you, I'm a, I want to give a practical tool. Those of you 
who are thinking about uh, the, who presented the manifesto, I want to challenge you just a little bit further to come up with something to help understand what Chase went through. And the reason I told you as a student, I was an interior design student, many of the classes that I took were with architect students, right? I was intimidated. I was the only black woman in the classes. Usually I was the only woman in the classes. The materials were expensive. Blueprints were expensive. And I was so intimidated, and I felt like I was falling behind. I had, I had no support system. And all my professors were male. They were not sensitive to me and my needs. I didn't even know how to approach most of them. And I just sort of faded out of the program. And uh, I had one professor who encouraged me. It was a class that I was taking on... Um, historic preservation and we, we did a historic preservation project and she said your writing is great we knew we need more students like you in this program and it was a female instructor that was my one female instructor and she really encouraged me but because all of the my architectural classes were so challenging I I quit I quit but think about and then I also want to just share we talked about the buildings that John Chase built and what he had to do, he had to leave Austin because he couldn't get a job. There are black architects who still, many black people start their professionals, start their own businesses. It's not always because they want to, because they're not, they're still not provided opportunities. And if you hear like a lot of black architects and others take government contracts, why? Because they have to. Those are the those, and so that impacts how they design, what they design, and other opportunities. So those students, I want a challenge, something very practical. How do we create a system to understand the challenges that Chase went through? What did they look like then? What policies? What this school? I'm not talking about anybody else, but the, what? policies or, or scholarships or support systems can we put in place to see when we're guilty of not doing things the chase way, right? Not providing the space, putting up barriers uh, to ensure that students, architect students flourish while they're here at this school to provide, and you, it's a lens or something that you can create Virginia knows a little, maybe something about, so she can help you with that, or some, some other people, or Kazike. But how can we look at it at a different way, something very practical to help students? And yeah, that's, that's all that I have about that. We recommend one book, and I'll be done. Uh, I know a lot of y'all have nothing to do during the summer. Um, kind of, you know, chilling, doing nothing. Um, if you're going to read a book, uh, a good book to read, if you're a nerd like me, is... Um, the, uh, the History of Racist Ideas in America. Uh, it talks, it goes way back. And if you're, if you're wondering how racism looks today, you have to kind of go back in your past a little bit. This book does a wonderful job and is well written. Uh, and it takes you from like pre, pre time before our, our country's founding to, to modern times. And it does such a beautiful job of that. I highly recommend it because it gives you a really good history of where these racist ideas come from and where they manifest and where they still exist today. Again, the, uh, the history of racist ideas in America. You know, they all just beat me to the punch because my concluding question was going to be, what all do you want to add or challenge us all to do? <laughs> They've got it covered. I think I'll walk away you all want it yourself. Um, but I will ask, I guess, you know, Ms. Carter and Virginia, if you guys also want to add to that. Well, my challenge is actually now kind of outside of the room. And, it, and it's a very small one, and I think it's, it's very easily done. But Virginia talks about lenses and the lenses that you, that you use and, and um, where, where you are in, in what you're doing. And um, the councilwoman talked about um, resiliency, and that and that's become 
a very big term um, in terms of how one designs and what it means to develop a community, what, what are the what kind of the backbones you need within a community. And we've talked about that in terms of environmental issues, in terms of, of you know, what are the interventions? You know, how, how far do you go with technological interventions versus being able to actually get back up and running if something bad happens? And we think of those normally in natural disasters. We need, but in fact, we're seeing that a lot of those are man-made disasters. Right now, everyone's, you know, kind of patting themselves on the back because we now, you know, 90% of our schools have had their active shooter drills and you know 75% of our kids know where to go and dive and who to hide behind or whatever because there's a shooter. We've learned how to harden our schools so you know you learn all about how to do you know not so ugly uh, security and, and, and defense. Um, and, and we do all of this somehow with this lens of sustainability. You know the great three-part story. Um, where we talk about energy savings and we talk about um, environment and, and, and the people that, that bit even the, work, the safety of the workers. But there is a third part of that. And I would just challenge every time the, your professor or who, whomever, whatever you design and you, you bring up the word sustainability, you talk about sustainability, you think about that third stool, which is really social equity. And I think that as we go through, as we go through our lead checklist, and we talk about policy, we have a city that says, you know, we're doing lead, everything you know, starts out at lead silver and we only go up from there. They talk about the Green Building Council. But when I look through that, you know, the, 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 it is, and, and believe me, I understand, you know, I, believe in climate change, and the, my problem with climate change is the people that it's going to affect the most are people of color. So as we talk about these things that are these feel-good things, that we are a community that embraces these, that we, that we want to do that, we, we want to make those things into policy, I challenge you to always bring up the third part of that sustainability equation and look at the social equity and what about what you're doing, whether it's every house is solar ready, well how do we pay for that? And what does that do in a community where the houses still are falling down? What does it do when I go in to get, I've got to remodel my house that's been in my family for 75 years and they say, oh, by the way, you've got to bring every bit of insulation up to this new level. You've got to do this. You have to have continuous insulation. What does that do to that person coming in there? They walk out, they're like a deer with headlights, and suddenly I can't do anything to maintain. That's the feeling they walk away with. Because the person they've talked to has not taken, and that person has no power to even take what that person, what the homeowner is bringing into it, to take any of their issues into consideration. And so where social equity starts and how it permeates through everything that, that, that you will touch, that to me needs to bubble up to the top and not be the third story. It needs to be the first, the first lens that you look in that triad of sustainability. Um, I'll keep it very brief because I already, I think, left with a lot of homework to do. Um, but um, I think, you know, when you think about these institutions that you're a part of, and for a lot of you right now, that institution is the university, right? But for those of you who are working already, to start to, um, to, start to interrogate the way that policies and practices have been aligned with this idea of normative culture that because that's the way we've done it for forever, that's the way it has, and how that impacts who feels a sense of belonging to that space and how it operates, right? But more importantly, what are the social consequences of the ways those policies and practices are performing? And I think the greatest example of that is when we think about where we are now as a community, right? Between why we see economic segregation, why we see mass gentrification, 
a large part is that it's because the, the, you know, when we look at the 1928 plan, I mean, that's still, that policy is still a part of our city's DNA, right? So start to interrogate the way that policies, you know, and practices, whether they're here in the School of Architecture, how they may, you know, um, to um, sort of address Nefertiti's own academic experience, how they may be serving to disempower, disenfranchise certain students, right, where they don't have the things they need to navigate this space, right, or within your organization or firm, how there are certain systems that are having social consequences to how we value certain spaces, how we value certain buildings. We, the event that we were at this morning was hosted at Laguna Gloria, which is a well-known, it's now owned by the, or in partnership with the Contemporary Austin. And the director opened up the talk by saying, you know, talking about this lovely $9 million grant they had to renovate that space. That's incredible, right? But there are spaces in East Austin that are just as equally culturally significant that we are scraping pennies around in order for them to be truly honored and truly um, sustained, right? And then we also think about access. There are no public buses that go to Laguna Gloria. It's in um, a Terrytown, right? So you start to think again about these, right? Well, it's just, you know, policies are just practices, but the consequences of who gets valued and who doesn't. And the thing I'll leave you with, because I'm biased, I sit on the board of Six Square, you should all go on a tour. They're offered second Saturday, I don't know. Yes. Every second Saturday, <laughs> sorry, it wasn't a test. Second Saturday of every month, and we're working on launching some larger ones around um, groups, and so it might be wonderful to uh, coordinate one with some students at the School of Architecture, but I think that would be a wonderful place to start. Well, thank you so much.